Okay, so hopefully all of you see the, the big version and not the presenter mode. Okay, sweet, thank you. All right, so uh, like I said, my name is Monica McCubry. McCubry today we're going to be talking about fungi. So um, not a topic that a lot of people know. Um, I remember one time a biologist here at Gavin Parks told us that if you know insects, plants, or fungi, you were golden and um, almost guaranteed a job because there's a lot of people that don't know about that. Um, and, and we always need people that know about those things because it's just not a very common thing to know a lot about fungi. Um, we have a couple people here in the agency that know a little bit about it, but there's not a good field guide for Nebraska or there's not a good, um, really good resource for Nebraska uh, that I know of. Maybe if you guys know of something that would be great. Um, you can put it in the chat for us, but I, it was kind of hard to find some information about some stuff in Nebraska, but um, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff in Nebraska and then some things that are in specifically North America as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Really quickly, I just want to point out um, uh, we've we uh, added some of this stuff, just letting you know, um, we do have the right to remove any of you, but I don't think we're gonna have a problem with that today. Um, but I just wanted to point that out for you guys as well. So keep the comments um, relevant to the uh, topic and, and, um, and appropriate for the topic as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about where fungi kind of emerged from or, or where are they from or what are they? So fungi evolved what scientists think in about 1.5 million years ago. So if you're familiar with how old our earth is, it's about four and a half billion years old, million years old, sorry. And this is about 1.5 million years ago, these fungi or the true early fungi started popping up. So they were likely aquatic. People think this so that they were in the water before um, they became on land. But we think that they um, evolved and kind of inhabited Earth about the same time that plants really started coming around as well. Uh, one thing that it, a lot of people kind of group plants and fungi together, they couldn't really be more further apart. Um, if anyone knows me, I'm a reptile and amphibian person. It's kind of like when people group together reptiles and amphibians, they're kind of the same. They're not. Um, we're actually closer related to frogs than reptiles are related to amphibians. So it's a very distinct um, different grouping, sort of like plants and fungi. Uh, fungi are actually more closely related to people and animals than they are to plants. So um, again, you can see that there's a huge different distinction between those two different groups. Um, about 25% of the entire biomass in the world is fungal. So there's a lot of fungi out there. And we believe that there's about 2.2 to 3.8 million species um, estimated in the world. We've only really discovered and um, really studied about 80,000 of them. Um, um, so again, there's a lot that we still don't know about these, um, this kind of weird kingdom that we, of information. So, so they're one of the most mysterious organisms on earth. People don't know a lot about them. Uh, the Greeks, they actually thought that mushrooms came from Zeus's lightning bolt um, because they kind of popped up um, after a rainstorm and they grew just everywhere. So people definitely thought that they were not from this planet. Uh, in the middle ages, people used them and called them fairy rings um, because of their circular patterns and their circular shapes. And they also thought that they were made by little people who danced around them at night. Um, in the new world, sometimes they were referred to as the food of the gods um, because if some of you are familiar with if you eat certain mushrooms they do have those hallucinogenic powers or um, symptoms that kind of come along with eating certain of those species um, so people thought that they gave people supernatural power so um, there's a lot of different kind of myths and um, uh, stereotypes following mushrooms and fungi and they're just again not something we know a lot about um, we do know, however, that some are very toxic um, and dangerous to people and or animals. Um, however, some are edible. Um, I know a lot of people like mushrooms. I am not one of those people that do like mushrooms, um, but again, there's people that are. Um, but they, a lot of the times, even since Roman times, they've been highly sought after. Um, if you any have ever heard of things like truffles or chanterelle mushrooms or morel mushrooms, these are very expensive mushrooms. Um, if you've heard of truffle oil or if you go to a really fancy restaurant and you order truffles, they're pretty pricey. Um, that's because they grow in North America and they're hard to find. And um, again, we just don't know a lot about them, but they're these highly sought after specific types of mushrooms that are edible and have a very good flavor about them. So besides being something that you put on your pizza, um, they do play an extremely vital role in our ecosystem. If you've ever found fungi or mushrooms um, when you've been hiking or walking around, you know that
fungus. Um, they also help dead plants, rotten logs, um, animal matter, biotic matter, all of those different things, they help them decay faster. They're kind of like a great cleanup crew for our ecosystems. All right, so some terminology. This one, I'm not going to lie, this PowerPoint gets into, or this topic gets into a lot of different kind of um, really specific details. Um, this is probably one of the most specific detail oriented one, just because there's so many different words um, that you guys need to know in order to understand about fungi. Um, so when we talk about fungi, it is the entire organism. So if I held up to you this mushroom here in this photo, that is the entire organism. That's what we're talking about. The mushroom itself is what we call the fruiting part or the fruiting body. Um, it is the one that usually typically appears above the ground and it can contains those reproductive parts. Um, we'll get into the different parts of the mushroom here in a second, um, but what you can notice is that this picture here, that whole image is the fungi, but what you see above the ground usually is what we call the mushroom. Um, they're usually considered members of the plant family, this is wrong. They are their own kingdom. Um, so there's a bunch of different distinctions between plant and fungi. Um, for one thing, fungi, they lack that chlorophyll. They don't have that green color um, that like vascular plants do. They also re rely on organic matter for nutrition. They do not make their own food like plants do. So plants are autotrophs. So we know that they make their own food. They use this photosynthesis to make their own food and their cell walls are made out of what we call cellulose. So very different is what we call fungi. They are called heterotrophs. So they do not make their own food. They have to get it from somewhere else. They take in food um, which they use for energy and their cell walls are made of something called chitin. So chitin uh, might you might have heard this word before if you're familiar with insects. Um, chitin is what is made out of their exoskeleton, so the hard outer shell of insects, same material as that of fungi. All right, so fungi, when we talk about this, what exactly is it? We've heard the word mushrooms before, but fungi can encompass a lot of different things. It's yeast, it's mold, it's mushrooms, all of those different things. So it just kind of depends on something that is unicellular, so one cell versus lots of different cells compacted together. So again, those cell walls are made out of chitin, and again, it's that same substance that is made out of the insect exoskeletons. So the smallest part of that fungi is what we call the hypha. So they're tiny threads, um, a lot of the times they're microscopic and you never see them, um, but a lot of the times they can be really compacted together and they form that continuous bunch or bundle of little threads. It kind of looks like little pieces of string um, or they can be separated. So when you have several of those hypha together, they form something called a mycelium, which makes up the fungus, the body of the fungus. That all sounds really hard to understand. And if you're not familiar with science and you're not familiar with fungus, that's okay. I have a picture here that kind of, I think does a really good job of explaining what hypha and what that mycelium is. So when we talk about that, that fungal body, some of them are really tiny. Um, but others can be huge and ginormous. So it just kind of depends on the species and it kind of depends on how they are made up. All right, so how fungi get their nutrition, there's three different types of ways that they can do this. Um, one of them, they're called saprophytes. Um, so they are the largest group of fungi and these are the ones that you find that break down that dead animal and plant material. Um, a lot of the times you will find them on like dead wood, dead tissue of living trees. A lot of the times you find them on dung and leaf litter. Uh, these are the ones that are beneficial. We like these kinds of fungi. A lot of the times they can be microscopic but some of them do produce really large um, amounts as well, or really large clusters as well. Sometimes, um, if you have uh, ash trees, um, besides the emerald ash borer that you have to worry about, a lot of the times ash trees will produce these really ugly brown um, mushrooms that form at the base of the tree. It just is something with the acid in the soil and um, the way that the, the tree and the roots kind of collaborate together, they form this fungi. Um, so sometimes people just find them as a nuisance. They pop up in your yard, they don't look very nice, um, and people just don't like them. So. 
Um, there's also a parasite. We all know the word parasite, it does not sound good. Well, same with mushrooms and fungi, it is not good. Um, bees actually attack other living organisms. They infiltrate those outer walls and they take that nourishment for themselves. So this is not a symbiotic relationship, it's a parasitic relationship. Um, basically, they're eating the other um, organism and they take that nutrients for themselves. A lot of the times you might have heard of things like the mildews, the powdery mildews, rust, apple scab, blights, wilts. If you've ever heard of Dutch elm disease, all of these different things are um, parasitic fungi. And if you notice this picture here, it's really pretty. This is apple rust, cedar apple rust. So if you've ever heard of that, that is a parasitic fungi. All right, so there's another good type of fungi. This is called mycorrhizal. Um, so symbiotic relationships form between the plant and the fungi, and these are good. Um, they help each other and they increase the amount of water and nutrient capabilities. So the plant gets stuff from the fungi and the fungi get stuff from the plant. Um, they make carbohydrates that when the plant forms photosynthesis, the fungi also gets to help and eat off these as well. Um, basically what happens is the fungi will provide the plant with increased protection against other pathogens while the plant provides it with extra nutrients. So there's two different types. There's the ectomycorrhiza, which ones that grow on the outside of the plant, and then there's endomycorrhiza, which grows on the inside of a plant, so ex or inside or outside. In about 90% of all of our vascular plants in the world, they have this relationship with this mycorrhizal fungi. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing actually. All right, so the parts of a mushroom, what are we actually looking at when we see a mushroom? So if you notice the cap, if you think of a hat, it's the top part of the mushroom. It's usually the most easily like identifiable thing. Um, it helps with identification um, because there's a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors um, and the way that they're formed. Some of them are conical, some of them are gonna be bell shaped, some are kind of inverted. Um, there's a lot of different types of caps that are out there. Also the textures are going to be different. So if you notice on my PowerPoint here, I have two pictures on top. These are different types of caps. That's what I really wanted you to see on those. So it, they could all be different shapes, colors, sizes. They might have different textures on top. Some of them are going to be really hairy. Some of them are going to have patches or scales on them. Some of them like that orange one are going to be kind of sunken in. So there's lots of different uh, ways that they look, which is really neat. And again, it's really helpful for identification. And then we also have something called gills. So when you look at the underside of a mushroom, there are those plate-like structures, um, and that is what produces spores, which is helpful for reproduction. That's how they reproduce. So sometimes they're attached to the stalk at a 90 degree angle, a 45 degree angle. Um, the easiest way to see them is if you slice open that mushroom longitudinally, long way, um, and you make a, what we call a spore print. Um, and basically you just make a print of that and you can see those gills in there. So again, on the underside of a mushroom, you see those long lines. Those are going to be your gills. Not all mushrooms will have this. Um, only what we call the gilled mushrooms will. All right, the stalk. Just what we talk, we usually talk about, it is the piece that attaches the cap to the ground. Um, so in gilled mushroom, the stalk is usually in the center. It can be off center or it might be stalkless. There are some that just simply don't have them. It can be smooth, dotted, scaly, powdery, hollow, solid, filled with tissue. There's lots of different things about fungi. Um, and that's one of the things that makes them really hard to identify is there's so many different types of variants and there's not good common names for them. Um, a lot of times it's hard to understand which ones are which. They look very similar to each other. There might be just one little difference between them. All right, some of them have veils. So when you think of someone getting married, they have a veil on their head, very similar to that. If you look at my pictures here, this bottom right-hand corner, the white one, that little kind of lacy looking piece, that's called a veil. So some mushrooms have this, some do not. And basically what it does is it protects those gills. Because remember the gills is what, is what has the spores in them. That is how they reproduce. If something happens to those gills and to those spores, that mushroom cannot reproduce. So some mushrooms just have this little pretty veil thing that protects um, the gills. Sometimes they will fall off and they will leave little rings around the mushrooms. Um, so if you ever see that, that could have been from a veil that had broken off. All right, I do have a really cool video that I wanted to show you guys. And so hopefully this works. I can show you. 
Um, and Monica, after that, I have a question for you. Okay, perfect. I let me show this video and then we will absolutely do that. So I think all of you guys can hopefully see this. Okay. All right. So you'll see on this video, it's a time lapse, obviously, but it's of different veils and different mushrooms and, and what they look like. And the music is fun too. So again, there's those really cool veils. Some mushrooms have them, some mushrooms don't. All right, I think you guys kind of get the, the picture there, but I did want to show that video because I thought it was really neat. Um, so we'll go back to this. All right, and Grace said that she has a question. Yes, sorry, I'm gonna pull up my chat. Um, they are asking, do you know how non-gilled mushrooms spread their spores? Non-gilled mushrooms? Right. Um, so gilled mushrooms are the ones that have the, the spores on the bottom, um, but I'm not sure about the other ones. Um, that's a good question. Um, I can absolutely figure that out and, um, and send that to you. That's a good question, actually. I really just looked at gilled mushrooms on this one, but those other mushrooms, um, that's, that's a good question. So I'm not sure. And again, I am definitely not a mushroom expert by any means. Um, I, I did a lot of research for this. Um, it took me a couple, couple weeks uh, to work on this. So um, it's definitely a learning experience for me as well, but that's a really good question. So we got right. one more as well. Yeah. Um, what was the first way mushrooms get food called? What was the what? The first way that mushrooms get their food, what was that way called? Um, was that the saprophytes? Is that what we're talking about? I can go back to that. There we go. This way? How they live on that dead tissue of trees. Um, is that what you guys are talking about? Uh, I think so. She would have to send a response in the chat, but I okay. think that's probably. And if you guys, and if you guys do have questions as well, um, the PowerPoint and the recording of this will also be online at the end too. Um, probably by tomorrow afternoon, it will be online. So if you miss something or you're taking notes or something, this will always be online and you can pause it as well too. Yep. And that was, that was what she was looking for. Perfect. And then I did have one more from way back in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and they were just wondering if the 25% biomass um, includes the known fungi or take into account the estimate of what there is that we haven't discovered. This is what we know for right now is Perfect. not include that 2.2, 3.8 million that we, we haven't estimated yet. So yeah, 25% from what I found is what we have currently. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Good questions. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit now about mushroom growth and reproduction. So how do these um, organisms reproduce with each other or reproduce period. So like many other organisms, they can actually do two different ways, asexually and sexually. So asexually, if you remember way back to, again, ninth grade biology or even before then, um, this is a clone. They're creating a copy of themselves. So there's not a lot of genetic differences or makeups that come with that. And they do this through mitosis. Um, this is usually a lot of times the, um, I'm going to say the less evolved, but the easier, I guess, um, things like yeast, yeast and molds are the ones that do this. Um, mostly yeast, a lot of molds will too, but not all of them. Um, so what they will do is they will actually release the spores into pieces through what we call budding, um, and that's that mitosis process as well, um, and they create clones of each other. So again, this is really good for those mushrooms that don't have um, ways to let loose their spores. Um, they're, they're the mushrooms that just create those copies of themselves, and they can do this fairly easily and rapidly, especially if the conditions, um, environmental conditions, are not good at the time. 
Um, and there's also the sexual way. So the two hypha of the mushrooms, what will happen is they basically fuse together to form a new mushroom and they grow near, ne usually next to each other or nearby each other. Um, and this is really helpful because you get those two different genetic makeups. Um, if there was a bunch of clones of myself, you're not going to have a lot of genetic differences. If I have clones um, of or two other things that fuse together, I get that different genetics from both of those different pieces. And they will do this through what we call meiosis and not mitosis. Um, so both ways, asexually and sexually, they generate spores. So the very tiny microscopic little um, fuzz balls basically that are in the air. Um, and those depend on the species, how they can release them. But some species have been known to release tens of millions of spores um, every hour. So just a single hour. And again, not all of them will make new mushrooms, but they release a lot of them so that at least some can uh, reproduce after that. All right, so I found another really cool video I want to show you. Um, this one is of spores releasing into the air. So I'm going to stop sharing this. Go to this video. No, I'm good. Okay. I think it's switching from different videos. So, all right. Do you guys see the video of the spores? Okay. But this is a really neat video because that backlight, you can see all the different spores coming out of these mushrooms. So, um, when we talk about tens of millions of spores within a single mushroom, this is what we're talking about. So, this is just two um, fruiting pieces, and this is all their spores. So, kind of a fun video to watch. But all of those little dots that you see, those are spores. So they could potentially turn into new mushrooms. All right. And again, if you guys are interested in this, you can certainly view um, them at a different time. So hopefully this works. All right. Not frozen, am I? All right, and you see the big spores thing. Okay, all right. So spores, when we talk about them, um, again, they can be produced either sexually or asexually within the mushroom. Um, and they are produced by the mycelium or that fruiting body of the mushroom. They're always microscopic. Like you saw that video, those tiny little dots, um, but they can be seen um, if you've ever seen it, what we call a puffball mushroom, which is a picture that I have here. A lot of the times they will release like a little, um, basically like a little poof um, and you will see the spores on there because there's so many of them together. Um, so there's two different types of spores. There's what we call the ASCII or the ASCII. Um, they're the spores that are produced internally. And then we have the basidia, which are ones that are produced outside of the mushroom. So, um, and then that fruiting body, you've heard that a couple of times throughout the presentation, but what is that? So this is developed when the conditions are right and they only grow for the time as long as it takes to disperse those spores. So they are usually brightly colored. This is kind of the top part of the mushroom that you see, this fruiting colored body. Um, they could be puffballs, they could be what we call brackets, the ones that are kind of look like shelves that are pushed up against a tree. Um, they're corals, they'll look like jellies or cups. They're usually brightly colored and they're about 90% water. Um, so they're only there to uh, release or disperse those spores. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys now a little bit about fungi that we have in Nebraska. So you might have heard of some of these, you might not have heard of some of these. And again, it's really hard to find information about them because we don't have a really good Nebraska mushroom field guide. If anyone out there wants to write one, 
please do it. I will pay you because I would like that information as well. And a lot of other people would find that useful too. All right, so giant puffball mushrooms. I'm sure some of you guys have found these. These can range from anywhere from like golf ball size to the size of a watermelon. Uh, they're usually found under small groups of trees or openings in the forest. Um, they're pear-shaped or usually uh, rounded. And this is the part that contains the spores. Um, so at the right time, what will happen is that they will crack open and puff and allowing that wind to take those spores so they can disperse and make new mushrooms. Um, they're edible too. You can actually eat them. Again, I'm not a mushroom person, so I have no idea what they taste like, but a lot of people say they don't have a lot of taste, um, but they kind of absorb the flavors around them. So for instance, I think someone used tofu one time and they're like, well, it tastes like tofu. So I don't know if they taste like tofu or if they just absorb the, the flavors that are around them when you cook. Um, the only concern with some of these mushrooms is, and again, all mushrooms when you go to eat them, you just have to identify that correct species. So if you are a thousand percent sure, yep, this is what it is, you can clean it in the field um, and then come back and eat it. If you are unsure, take the whole thing with you, including the stalk, um, so that you can identify it because a stalk and the uh, cap of the mushroom are really helpful in identifying that. Um, so if you cut this thing open, and you find that it's thick and hard and it has this white fleshy part inside, it's okay to eat. It's not, it's not rotten or it's not bad. Um, don't eat anything that is brown, black, or purple inside. That means that it's simply past its prime and it's not good for you to eat and could be toxic. But I'm sure a lot of you guys have found these um, in Nebraska. Uh, we had them in our yard when we first moved in um, to our house and I didn't know what they were, but they are super cool when you, when you touch them, they poofed everywhere, so. All right, these are some of the prettiest uh, mushrooms that we have in Nebraska and Halloween coming up. These are called jack-o'-lantern mushrooms. These are actually poisonous, so don't eat them, um, but they grow in clusters on wood and oftentimes people find them in urban settings. So even in the city, they're fairly common around dead trees, dying trees, um, especially east of the Rocky Mountains. So if you slice them open, their flesh is orange. That's what they get their name, jack-o'-lantern. Um, so that orange color and it kind of looks like a pumpkin. Um, they're very common at the base of trees, especially oak or deciduous trees. So especially in Southeast Nebraska, where there's a a lot of oak trees. They're very, very common in that area. Sometimes people confuse them with another mushroom that's highly edible and sought after, and they're those called those chanterelle mushrooms. Um, however, these, they don't grow in dense clusters like these guys do. Um, apparently, and I again don't know, um, but I read a couple places that apparently if you take them, the gills, um, if you take them into like a dark closet, the gills will glow um, in the dark. I've seen a couple people say, yes, it's absolutely true. And I've seen some people say, nope, it's not true. So you will have to decide for yourself if you ever find them. Again, do not eat them, but you can touch them and take them into um, like a dark closet and see if they actually do glow. But they do contain a toxic chemical, again, if you eat them, um, that can cause severe stomach upset, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches. So not fun, do not eat them, but they are pretty. All right, oyster mushrooms. A lot of people want these and they want to eat them. They are one of the most common cultivated mushrooms within the world. Um, a lot of people like them because they have kind of delicate texture and kind of a savory flavor. Um, if you've ever eaten um, hot and sour soup, you might have had these in there as well. Um, they're very broad and they look similar to oysters. That's how they get their name. They have that kind of fan shaped. Um, in Nebraska, they're found a lot within the moist and uh, river creek beds and the hardwood, softwood trees. Um, and they usually grow within huge, dense clusters of each other. So, all right, chicken of the woods. A lot of people have heard this too. Um, sometimes they're called the chicken mushroom or the sulfur shelf, chicken fungus, chicken of the woods, all those different names. They're this fungus or this um, mushroom. So they are considered a great fall mushroom. Um, everything that I've seen, I've seen more mushrooms in the fall than I do the spring. So fall is a great time to go out and find these mushrooms. These are usually very large. They can get extremely large and they're what we call shelf mushrooms. So if you notice in this picture, there's a log and they kind of come off of the log like a shelf. Um, that's just kind of how they grow. They don't have a cap and a stalk like other mushrooms do. And usually they're very bright colored. They're orange to kind of yellow, and then they have yellow tips on the very, very outside of them. And these guys are called polypores, which means that they disperse their 
uh, spores through small holes on the underside of the cap. So the top part, they have it underneath and that's how they um, drop or disperse those spores. And again, not a mushroom person, but I've heard that they have a usual kind of a lemony, meaty taste to them. A lot of people just put them in batter and fry them and eat them. All right, this one is very pretty. I really like this mushroom, it's called the turkey tail mushroom. Um, so they get their name because if you look at it, it kind of resembles a turkey tail, um, a wild turkey tail and the colors in those feathers. And they also belong to the polypore mushroom group. So they don't have gills and on the undersurface, they are known for having tiny little pores or openings where they drop those spores. Um, these are known for being wood loving mushrooms. So they like dark areas and wood and um, um, decaying, dying trees. Um, the first fungus to receive attention from Western medicine and Western scientists, they have been found to contain anti-inflammatory properties, they provide immune boosting compounds, and they support the gut and overall health. So they're very highly sought after mushrooms. Um, people will crush them and you can actually buy them as supplements. All right, the wood ear mushroom, not the prettiest or the sexiest looking mushroom, um, but they do look like ears and that's how they get their name. Um, they kind of look like um, they have that rubbery jelly like appearance or texture on them and they're usually found about May through November. So you can still find them if you go out looking for them. They are edible and medicinal mushroom. Um, these are the ones, excuse me, that you might have eaten them in um, hot and sour soup, uh, not the oyster ones. Uh, but their spores are produced again on the underside um, of the ear part of the mushroom. And these guys apparently have positive effects on blood coagulation and it decreases that blood cholesterol level. So again, mushrooms are actually very healthy. Um, a lot of people use them in supplements or eat them because they have a lot of protein and a lot of vitamins and minerals. All right, this one, I had no idea it existed in Nebraska, but it's very pretty mushroom. It's called the lion's mane mushroom. Also, can we recognize that how cool the names are um, on some of these mushrooms, as you'll see here as we keep going, but lion's mane, woodier mushroom, uh, turkey tail, just kind of some fun names. So uh, these are a typical fall mushroom that are found in Nebraska. Um, you can eat them and they are actually highly sought after. People like them. Um, they kind of have a seafood taste is what I read and people have said. Um, they possess two different compounds that actually stimulate the growth of new brain cells which could potentially help to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. So mushrooms, again, are very highly sought after. They have a lot of chemicals that we just don't even know about yet. Um, these guys will usually grow in big clumps or clusters, and you'll notice that they have the long kind of dangling spines on them. Um, that's where they get their name lions, main mushroom. All right, uh, these are neat too, scaly inky cap mushrooms. So that inky cap name, as you notice in the picture here, some of them kind of have that dark um, blacky goo color. Um, these are ones that are found in Eastern North America and Nebraska. They have a lot of scaly patches on them. So earlier when we were talking about the caps of the mushroom, I said that some of them had scales. This is what we mean by scales. If you notice, it looks like there's little patches on the top. Those are those scales. So as this mushroom matures, they will actually change color. They start as whitish gray color um, from the gills being separated. And then as they mature, they will have this kind of blackish goo that comes down. And that's why these mushrooms have different colors on them. Um, people say that they have a foul taste. Again, I'm not sure, maybe you have eaten them, um, but that's what kind of I heard from people. All right, this one, looks like a bird's nest. And again, a very cool name. Uh, these are easily recognized and there's tons of different species in North America. Not all of them look like this, um, but they get their name because they look like a nest with eggs in it. So that bird's nest fungus. Um, these grow on the forest floor in open areas. Um, when these mushrooms are fresh, they have those spore bearing structures at the bottom of the cups. That's the egg looking things um, that look similar to those, uh, the egg, the bird's nest um, of eggs. Um, this cup is de designed to allow these egg-like structures um, to eject um, out by raindrops. So when the conditions are right and the rain hits them, they poof open and that is how those spores are released. All right. 
Morel mushrooms. Everyone knows about these. They're highly sought after in Nebraska. You can actually get a pretty good price for them. Um, however, they can really range within sizes. Um, there is ones that are about the size of a grain of rice all the way open to a foot tall. So um, I'm sure some of you have seen mushrooms that have been really large. Um, in Nebraska, they can get really large as well. These are the ones that are spring mushrooms. Not necessarily too many find them in the fall. They're more of a spring after the rains come mushroom. They are non-toxic when they are cooked. Um, people really like to eat them. They have a good flavor. They do range in colors though from brown, gray, black color, but they have this kind of honeycomb uh, textured top to them and that's kind of easily distinguishable from other mushrooms. So people say if you want to get into mushroom foraging, start with these because they're extremely easy to recognize. Not a lot of people um, confuse these with other types of um, mushrooms. However, there are false morels um, that sometimes, I don't really think they look like them. There's a very big distinctive difference between them. Um, but again, you do have to be cautious when you're doing that. All right, so those are the ones in Nebraska. We have a ton more that I did not cover because we only have so much time. So you are welcome to go research those on your own. Um, but do we have any questions before we get into some dangerous fungi and some really quick information on how to collect these? Um, we just had someone ask if the bird's nest uh, mushroom is, is poisonous. It, I don't think it is, but again, um, don't go eat it um, and, and tell me that I'm wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that people eat those, um, but that's a good question. So. Yeah, I was also just going to add that when you collect morels, you should always be sure you're not getting them from a, like an area of recent flooding or something yeah. like that. So. Just and why, why is that, Grace? Go ahead and tell us why that is. Um, because if they are growing in an area that has been recently flooded, oftentimes in that water there are like toxic things, um, runoff that comes into the water and then it's absorbed into the mushroom and then if you eat it, it can be bad for you. So that is an, a different way that a mushroom could be bad for you. So 